Welcome to Auto Off Topic. Hello, Brad. Good afternoon, Andrew. How are you doing today? I'm good, but it's late evening for me. It's not that late. It's like 10 o'clock. Magic time zones. You live. It's like just time to get home from work for me. It's only quarter past seven. So, oh, since we talked about time, let's move on to our next subject, which is always weather, correct? That's right. Yeah. I actually so, had a really nice day. How's the weather out there? It was great. Yeah, <laughs> it's yeah it was like 90 here. It was beautiful. It was finally in the 60s here. Excellent. Yeah, it's already getting warm here, but that's okay. That's why I live here. I'm not going to complain. Mm-hmm. And when anything under 100 here is fine. So, no stress. <laughs> anything where my face is not melting off is fine. That's, I mean, that's. You joke, but that's a that's a legitimate measure of temperature, I think. Yeah. So it's fine. I just do things at night. Just just keep screaming it's a dry heat. And that's what I do. Just no one wants to hear it anymore. The best part of the whole thing is like seasonal affect syndrome used to be for the winter. Yeah. And now it's for the summer. <laughs> so but it's not as bad because I can still I can still do things sometimes. Just not at like noontime. Just become a vampire. Like noon to five is really when you don't want to go outside too much. Yeah. But, just, you know, you should be working there anyway, right? Summertime is goth Brad. <laughs> Goes out. He doesn't leave the house. <laughs> yeah. Goes out only Works at night. At night. <laughs> Dresses all in black. Actually, I don't recommend dressing all in black going <laughs> no. out at night. No, are there? Phoenix, <laughs> because we have the worst car drivers in the entire goddamn country here. And we have the highest rate of pedestrian accidents in the entire state, entire country. So. Oh, Okay. That, yeah, that's a true that got number. dark. Like, but we legitimately have the highest percentage of pedestrian car accidents here. I don't know if it's because it's so dark and people go outside after night at nighttime, or if it's because there's so many wandering homeless, or if it's because it's a grid system and people drive 400 miles an hour. Mm. So, but I just tend to stay off the roads at night. Well, actually, about two hours before I started this podcast, we had another accident across the street. The general uh, six-month accident cycle here. I don't think it's even been six months since the last one. No, it, it hasn't. That's what Stephanie said, because she was home during the last one. It was, it was in the middle of the day. Yeah, They're I think usually it was like at night. January. Yeah. <laughs> it wasn't that long ago. Because wasn't she, like, walking in the front door when the last one happened? Well, no, her her office is, like, right at the front window, so this is, like, right in front of her. <laughs> well, I thought there was one that she was walking in the front door, and it caught it on camera while she was standing there. Oh, that was the truck taking down the power lines. Never mind. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that was that. So and then I had that. Lots of activity in front of Andrew's house. Yeah. <laughs> so I have the highest percentage of pedestrian accidents here, but you have the highest percentage of accidents directly in relation to your front door. Yeah. By a long shot. Well, I live in a busy street, and it's like 45 miles an hour, and there's a slight bend in the road. Like, not a lot. Yeah. Just a slight. You'd think it'd be like a 90-degree bend that's throwing people off, but it's just the slight bend that is enough to throw people off. Yeah. It's like a move your hand a little bit to the left, and you'll be okay. Yeah. I think it just goes to show. It probably is the same reason we have such a high you know, incidence of pedestrian collisions out here is because it's just distracted people that's gotta be what it is it yeah i my street's really long and straight and then it's the slight curve and then to a stoplight so i think people are coming down the street oh here's a good time to check my phone oh no the road turned and now i'm into the guardrail yeah i wonder if they like fixate on the stoplight and don't even yeah. pay attention to the road because so it's only like you know, a few hundred feet to the stoplight from that curve. So maybe they see the stoplight, like, oh, a stoplight's coming. I'll get ready to slow down. Oh, also, I should turn. And there's also a pothole out there right now. So, like, every time a heavy truck goes by, it's like a loud bang, especially with, like, an empty, like, dump truck 18-wheeler. Trailers carrying trailers. And, like, it happened, and we are watching TV, and Stephanie's like, that sounded like an accident. I'm like, no, it's another truck, because it's literally been happening all week. (laughs) <laughs> and I was like, I'm like no and then she, go, she goes up front and she's up front in the, like you know our living is in the back of the house she's at the front of the house for like a while and then I see the blue lights and then I see the red lights I was like damn she was right <laughs> and she didn't tell you <laughs> no <laughs> awesome so you know you've been together for a long time which doesn't even go in to tell you she was right and you were wrong <laughs> so 
Anyway, yeah. <laughs> moving on. We've talked about the weather. We talked about car crashes. We've talked about what's next on our list of greatest hits. Is it I, uh, Project Car Updates next? Well, real quick, before we get into that. Um, <coughs> excuse me. A little callback time? Just getting over a cold. No, um, I want to talk about where I started a Discord server for Auto Off Topic. Oh, yes. So if you are listening to this, you are invited to the Discord server. Excellent. So just message me on social media or the Auto Off Topic page. Um, probably Instagram's easier uh, if, you, if you're using I mean, Instagram if you, gets checked more often. Yeah, sure. if you if you don't use Instagram, you can do it through Facebook, but Instagram's easier. Just let me know and I'll send you the invite. And uh, I have a couple chat things set up in there, like just a general auto off topic chat and talk about cars. I got a project car section. Everybody can talk about their project cars, what they're doing. They need help with stuff. Try to figure it out, crowdsource it. I've got one for like pets. I got one for scale out of cast. <laughs> we are getting to that. And uh, so if you want to talk about scale right. stuff, um, you can go over there. And I think there's also a pedantic corrections. We have the, yeah, pedantic uh, corrections department one. Yep. yep, for sure. And we also have the um, unannounced yet uh, for noon cup yes. page there as well. So I think that's a great place to plan that event as well. Yeah, so, so. I think uh, it's a lot easier because people do like to interact with us. Um, if we just do it through one place instead of like through different messaging services on different social media platforms. Sure. Sure. It's, and and then you can talk to other listeners so we can have yeah. like a little community with it all all six people can get together and chat hey it'll be nice i don't care if it's six yeah. people or 60 people <laughs> yeah. it'll probably be fun just be cool yeah, it'll That's be fun all. and uh we're, we're planning well we're calling it the four noon cup it was kind of a combination of terms that you and i kicked around for a while um basically meaning the morning cup right before noon is a synonym for morning yep so uh, you've probably seen a bunch of these events going around, which is slightly irritating because we've been talking about this for a while. Uh, and didn't jump enough room for all of them. Yeah. Um, that, that, like breakfast drives or they're basically like uh, cars and coffee, but not a cars and coffee because you're not just sitting in a parking lot. So we're, uh, we're bouncing some ideas around. We're going to call it the Four Noon Cup, which is a callback to the uh, Gran Turismo Sunday Cup, the beginning races in Gran Turismo. I think it's kind of a neat little... Um, a neat little, I don't know, car culture deep cut, I guess. Yeah. It's not going to be obvious what it is. Uh, it's not any kind of a club. It's nothing like that. It's just a very loosely organized event that I think we're going to try to do once a month during the driving seasons, which, you know, is again, is different whether you're out here or out there, but we'll have a West Coast and an East Coast version. I think the general idea is to meet up somewhere in the morning uh, usually probably like an independently owned coffee house or breakfast shop, get some people together on either the discord server or kind of an invite only, you know, we don't want a hundred people. We want like 10 <laughs> go there, meet up, you know, patronize a local patronize, excuse me, a local you don't patronize. Them. <laughs> Please don't patronize them. No patronize them, patronize a locally owned, you know, coffee shop or breakfast spot, you know, grab some coffee, grab some breakfast, and then totally optional afterwards, we'll do like a, you know, a drive somewhere, maybe a fun fun road somewhere, maybe a photo spot, just some other kind of destination. Uh, it's going to mix up each month, I think is the plan to do a different coffee shop, a different breakfast place so that, you know, one day it might be a place that's 10 minutes from your house. And one day it might be a place that's a 45 minute drive, but everybody will have like a turn cycling through a local place. So places are going to be, um, you know, suggestions taken for places to start because we don't know all of them, obviously. Yeah. So in the, in the greater Phoenix area, in the greater Boston area, yeah, I'd say north of Boston mostly. Yeah, and then you don't but, burn out a spot by having and all and you don't burn out a spot. <laughs> it's not the same every time. It's invite only, so you have ten people, maybe maybe a little more, maybe a little less. That way you can show up, and you're just a group of people. You're not an actual event. Uh, I think it's a good way to build some camaraderie in the community. It's a good way to bring like-minded people together. 
you know, we want to have, we, we, we just want to build a, a, a community of like-minded people who, you know, basically, basically the only rule is don't be a douchebag, you know? Right. We're not going to have a car rule, you know, obviously some kind of an enthusiast vehicle is encouraged, but if your project car is your only enthusiast vehicle and it's down and you want to show up in your 2022 Corolla, I don't care. It's, it's more just of a, uh, you know, a gathering of car people, kind of a, a social club, I guess, without being a club, because it's very important to know it is not a club. We're not starting a car club. We don't do car clubs. We're just having a gathering. So it's off the books. It's unofficial. It's invite only. It will be discussed on the Discord. I think we're going to start one. I think my May is pretty jam-packed. June will probably be the first one out here. I don't know what Andrew's plans are in the New England region, but it might have a lot to do with you know, discussions that go on on the page. So we're going to kind of play that one by year. It's out there. We have little, you know, little logo ideas and we'll probably have a little sticker you can slap on your car to, you know, kind of be a part of this secret, not a club club. Mm -hmm. So I think it'll be a little, a little nice little, a little nice little, a lot of of times using the word little there. I think it'll be a nice little gathering and it'll be something we can maintain. And like I said, it's very unofficial. It will just be, you know, a few of us enjoying our automobiles or SUVs or pickup trucks or motorcycles or whatever you have that you're into and enjoying some friends. And, you know, if we introduce, you know, person A's friend to person B's friend, and now you have person C's friends, both of them, that's what we're looking to do here. We're looking to build the community and build a positive, a positive community here. So let's keep it going. Let's do this. Let's do this thing. Cool. So join join up, start chatting, and uh, we'll get some plans together. If you don't live in Boston or Phoenix, uh, I apologize. Sorry we spent so long talking about it, but, you know, we can only do what we can do, right? Right. You know, if there winds up being another group of people that happen to live in, I don't know, Idaho, then, hey, we're totally down with uh, some splinter cell groups out there, I guess. But, like I said, the important thing to remember is just it's not a club. Don't be a douche. Hang out, have a good time, patronize, don't patronize. Right. And uh, enjoy some new places and some new sites and, you know, exchange of ideas and photos and and time. So I think it's going to be fun. Cool. All right. I've got some pedantic corrections for us. Okay. I'm down. Um, So the other week. I love corrections. I really like corrections are my favorite thing because two things. One, I love learning things. And two, it means people are still listening. Right. <laughs> so that's good. <laughs> so I made an offhand kind of throwaway comment uh, that we were going to make Corvettes uh, or they're going to make the new Corvette. It's rear engine, but now it's front wheel drive. Uh, <laughs> and I said, oh, maybe that actually existed as a car, but it was probably like in the 20s or something <laughs> like a brass right. car. Uh, actually, uh, our buddy Myron Vernis sent us a link to the Gregory sedan. Yes. At the lane motor museum. So it's of course, one- of course the lane motor museum. Yeah. Who else would own this car? Except for maybe Myron. <laughs> I still need to go there. I've never been. It's a great spot. It really um, is. It's one on one. Apparently <laughs> Ben F Gregory, an advocate of front wheel drive, just like me. Uh, yeah. It says Gregory made cars on and off for a span of 42 years. First cars were built around 1920. It was not until 26 later, following World War II, that Gregory returned to designing cars. Uh, and he had so he designed a sedan with a rear-mounted engine that drives the front wheels. Yeah, it is the yeah, only example of this layout which called for a propeller shaft uh, when all other front-drive cars avoided it. <laughs> so weird. Three-speed Borg Warner. He never formed a company. He only made the one. And then he planned on also making a sports car, but didn't make that either. So I did a little deeper digging into this conversation because yeah. there were there was one other kind of a concept car that was rear-engined okay. front-wheel drive, and it was the Dimaxion made, made by that? a guy named Buck Munz- Buckminster Fuller, which everything about that is like 1930s like film noir detective show. Like... Wait, but it legitimately happened in 1937. Isn't that like a baseball player? Buckminster Fuller? I don't know. It sounds super familiar. 
He's definitely not that. Uh, if if I am to believe the is he quasi famous person? Quasi famous? Qu- quasi famous person? Uh, he's an architect, systems theorist, author, designer, inventor, philosopher, critic of work, and futurist. Oh oh oh! He designed the, the oh the Dimaxion bu- house. The yeah, yeah, the round and house the, and the buckyball. Okay, that's so the Epcot Center. That is a buckyball. Okay, well there <laughs> you go. That's why it sounded familiar. So also he's from Milton, Massachusetts. So he's probably more famous to people like us who lived in Massachusetts. No, he's just a famous so, like architect. <laughs> for sure. Weird. But he did he did make um he did make one car uh called obviously like he called everything the oh. Dimaxion. Okay. And it okay. looks very similar to a house that he I'm made which is round. Max. The car is very round. And it was a front yeah. wheel drive rear engine three wheeler. So obviously not a successful design. <laughs> oh. Oh, that's cool looking. Right. It's so bizarre. It looks kind of like a train car almost, or like an airplane fuselage. It looks, it reminds me of the um, that Scarab car. It's got some Scarab lines to it. It looks like if you took a Volkswagen bus and like inflated the front of it. Like just pumped it full of air and it bulged out on all sides. It's definitely a futurist, like this is what cars in the future are going to look like. You know, Maximize space the, and aerodynamics. The geographic dome doesn't say anything about the one at uh, Epcot Center, but I definitely believe you. It's yeah, that's what it's designed after. It's a geodesic dome. Yeah, Fuller's geodesic dome patent. Yeah. The same design as Boston Field. Yeah. So anyway, cool. But he made a car too, so. Now we have a, uh, a combination of two of them there. There was one other powered vehicle that was a front end, uh, sorry, front wheel drive rear engine, but it was like a machine gun carrier for military purposes. So I didn't count that one as as a uh, front wheel drive rear engine car. But anyway, be cool to see one in modern era. See if it actually happens. Not the thirties and forties. Doesn't make much sense, but be cool to see it try at least. I mean, you had Peugeots. They did the front engine, front wheel drive with the engine like behind the transaxle, <laughs> which was weird. Oh, okay. So I got this from um, Buckminster Fullerene, which is a chemical compound in the shape of a soccer ball, which looks like okay. a geodesic dome. And they named it after Buckminster Fuller. Oh, okay. They call them Buckyballs. Interesting. I'd never heard that one, but now I see that. It's funny because they say footballs, but then they show soccer balls. <laughs> well, you know, it depends on the country you're in. <laughs> yeah. So look at that. You come here for cars, you learn all kinds of things. Yep. We're, we're learning as we go Maxion. along here, too. That's our... Dimaxion is the car. Sheet aluminum, ash frame, assembly, Bridgeport, Connecticut. Of the one. <laughs> Three prototypes built. Oh, three of them? Okay. Either way, it's cool. I would like to see one. Do any still exist? Well, there's modern pictures of it. Two on display at the National Automobile Museum in Reno, Nevada. Excellent. I'll be there next week. Oh, 2010 replica of 1933 Dimaxion. Which is still cool. I'd like to see a, a new replica of it even. Just to see exactly what it looked like, but it looks like a like a, from the side it looks like a bean. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, I would I'd say look this car up. It's quite interesting. And uh, oh, and the lane Mu- the lane motor museum commissioned a replica. Okay. Yeah, I've been to the lane. Did not see this, but they don't always have their full collection out on display yeah. either. So. Sometimes they loan their vehicles off to other places and they have a whole basement area that's not always open. You have to be there the right time to see like, you know, the basement display. So I'll have to, uh, I'll have to go back there again too. I've heard they've gotten some new cars since last time I was there. And again, I haven't seen everything and that place is absolutely wild. So it's well worth the trip. So there we go. People there are very knowledgeable of the weird stuff too. So anyway, so thanks. Thanks. Uh, well, big thanks to, uh, Myron for pointing that out and but thanks to the internet for showing us the other ones yeah so otherwise he probably wouldn't even brought it up again but 
Any other callbacks, Andrew? No. I think that's it. Excellent. Have you done any uh, Project Car stuff? I started to, and then I stopped. Okay. I was about to do the... I wanted to do the valve cover gaskets on the Q45, because they are leaking. Okay. And then I, I got as far as taking the air intake tube off and realized that the entire air intake upper plenum needs to come off because the throttle body is hanging over the driver's side valve cover. So it's like doing them in like the Montero. You got to pull yeah, them. Yeah, I was like, take off. I could try, but it would be a l- really hard. <laughs> yeah, it sounds annoying. Yeah, it's it doesn't not sound too impossible, bad. but it sounds annoying. It's a little bit of work. It's like yeah. doing the uh, fixing the fuel leak on my um, DeBarex. I think the more annoying part about it was that you bought that special tool so you could do that coolant temp sensor without pulling the intake off, and uh, now you got to pull the intake off anyway. Yeah. Well, that's all right because I I needed to figure out something else. <laughs> Trying to, it needed it. And it needed it sooner than later, so it's fine. Sure. Yeah, you were trying to trying to learn what was what, how to how to make it work. Yeah, I got to throw oh. me a code for a mass airflow meter, so I cleaned it really well, like a whole can of mass airflow sensor cleaner. Well, hopefully, be by next recording, we'll have a, a story about the car being all put back together and being perfect, right? I hope so. So, I mean, that's definitely the thing when you're working on stuff is especially with tight quarters just take as many things out of your way as possible because you'll spend more time trying to work around them than exactly you or breaking something so just yep. carefully take them off and put them aside it's way less work in the end <laughs> like yeah, by the it, time it you've to... trying to maneuver something out you could have the other pieces out of the way it seems super daunting sometimes when you look at how much stuff has to come off but if you just think about it in simple terms, like everything is lefty, loosey, ratty, tidy. <laughs> and if you're taking it apart from the top down, chances are pretty good. It's going to be significantly easier than trying to take apart pieces in the middle. And you're not going to have parts dropped and parts broken as much because you have full access. Yeah. So. And I don't, I don't know. Probably it's the way my brain works. I can literally look at stuff like this now. And I'm like, okay, this needs to go first. Then this. Then this, then this. This to this to this to that. Yeah, yeah I can kind of picture it in my head. Uh, you can see the levels when you look at something. And you know, it's and all, again, everything's connectorized on the car. All the harnesses on top, they'll all unplug, fold yeah. them away. Well, the that's why guys that work on these cars all the time could probably do an engine swap in an afternoon, you know? It's, yeah. It's not difficult once you know. The only thing that is slightly annoying to me uh, is that the passenger side, there's a plastic uh, vanity cover on the front of the valve train uh, that's just simply covering the front of the engine to make it look even with the other side that's covering up like some uh, vacuum valves. And okay. to get it off, I was looking at it, I'm like, oh, I have to drain the coolant to get this off because the upper radiator hose is right against it. That's like, annoying. Like I can't. <laughs> yeah. So the car's going to get new coolant. <laughs> And that's the difference between, you know, middle age backyard mechanic versus 17 year old backyard mechanic, because back in the past, they probably cut that thing right out of there. <laughs> I don't need this anymore. It's just a cover. <laughs> yeah. Um, but you want to do it right. It's fine. I ordered a couple more parts. I was like, well, since it's going to be deep in there and I can have access to the knock sensors, I'm going to replace the knock sensors. Right. Because I did get a code for those, but I don't think they're bad. I think it's. Because the car is o- is OBD one, I think it's saying knock sensor circuit because it's having a misfire, but it sure. doesn't have a misfire code. Sure, I remember that's something that would happen with DSMs back in the day. Like a misfire would cause knock because it's basically a very simple sensor that just hears a different sound or different or a different vibration and reads it as knock if it's yeah. not knock. Any any time the engine runs rough. It's going to sound different and make a, a, yeah. a knock. <laughs> make it sound like knock. So, no. but I'll swap them out anyways, because I can get to them. Yep, and you're already and, there. <laughs> and then I can say, it's got new knock sensors. It's got new coil packs. <laughs> so Everything new. Well, um, I've been working on something. Yeah. You ready for more Cressida talk? Go for it.
this is uh, going to become the Cressida podcast. So I've driven the car further. Not a lot further, but I've driven it further. The problem I'm running into now is now that the car starts and runs and idles really well, I cannot accelerate the car past 15 miles per hour. Okay. Not sure what exactly the issue is yet. Mm-hmm. I've been doing a bunch of digging and I'm kind of at an end pass. So obviously the first thought was throw some carbs on it. Throw some carbs on it. Absolutely. Give me a Holly double bumper and a, no, it's, it's, it, it will, it idles so well and it starts up so fast that I know something stupid will fix it. It's just digging through to get to the right stupid thing to fix it. So it's OBD negative one. It pre predates OBD. Does it not have. So how many injectors does it have? Is it multi-port? It has six injectors. It is multi-port. Actually, okay. it has seven injectors. It has okay. a, a cold start injector as well. So yeah, it's, it's a multi-port car. They're a very standard um, uh, two-pin Bosch injector. Nothing special. It doesn't feel like it's the injectors being the issue. I mean, obviously it could. It could be a combination of things. They are old. They have been sitting for a while. The problem is taking them out is not simple. It's going to require, like what we just talked about, digging down to get to them. I can certainly do it. I'm does just it, trying. Does it have to... an O2 sensor? It does have an O2 sensor, yes. Yeah, I'm just, the way you describe it, it just sounds like something is happening where it's not, when you're tipping into the throttle, it's not adding fuel to the system. <laughs> yeah, no, and it's very similar to like the problem I was having with the Star, I'm still having with the Starium, but I know what it is now, where I couldn't rev it past 3,800 RPM. It's very similar, mm-hmm. very similar setup or very similar problem, I should say. So I've been trying to die yet for a while. I haven't worked on it every day. I've worked on it for a few days. Uh, it's frustrating because I don't have a lot of parts. Parts aren't super simple to get. I've been trying to find some simpler ways to test it. Uh, first things first, I fixed a bunch of vacuum leaks. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's because a good obviously way. the first yeah the first thing yeah. you want to do is fix vacuum leaks because you don't get you might not be getting any advance on something. Uh, yeah, exactly. So I fixed a bunch of vacuum leaks. Uh, I think I have most of them. I have one that I hear a vacuum leak under idle. Mm -hmm. But once I tip into the throttle even a little bit, the vacuum leak goes away. Yeah, because it builds pressure. Because it builds pressure. So wherever that's coming from shouldn't be affecting it on throttle if it goes away on throttle. So I don't think that's it. There's no more noise of vacuum leaks. I got to still dig out that one vacuum leak. Um, That's a problem. Uh, Rewind a little bit. The first time I drove it out of the driveway. Well, it it depends. You, you do want to fix that leak, right? Because I do want to fix it, one hundred percent. Yeah. Because if it's if it's throwing off the air mix for the mass air meter, it's not giving you the right fuel mixture. Yeah, it could be. So that. It, it you could have a gross leak, and it's uh, like it's just like all that air is escaping, and it's it could be pushing too much fuel that it's actually blowing the spark out. You know, I didn't think of being too much fuel. I should probably pull a plug and see what they look like. Because, yeah, I mean, that's that's a possibility, too. Like, it'll... I just, I just did all new plugs in it, I so. mean, it would smell real rich, too, though. Yeah, probably. I don't know. I'll have to, I'll have to double check that. It's like so a, I know... It's like a sputtering and, like... It doesn't sputter. It just... It, it makes, like, a... I'm going to make a sound here. You know, Is it like that's farting? Good. Like, no, it's like a whoa. Like it almost sounds like air blockage. Hmm. You know, you, you get in, it, cars idling, it sounds fine. You get in the throttle, you hear it rev up. It's like, it's like you hit the air suction in like the, and then it goes whoa. And it won't go beyond that point. It won't accelerate past that point. Hmm. So it's almost like it's a blockage. So one of the things that I noticed it was doing at first was when I put my foot in the throttle and accelerated up was blowing the dipstick out. Mm-hmm. So I was like, all right, we got a PCV issue. Car doesn't have a standard PCV valve. It has a T fitting and a hose that comes off of the valve cover. And so I assume that there's some sort of, you know, door system inside the valve cover that is the PC, acts as the PCV valve and it goes out of the valve cover it's a crossover where part of it goes into the backside of the intake and part of it goes into the air intake part of the intake. 
So I took all that off and it was gunked up solid. It was like a gel inside. And I cleaned all that out and made all those hoses look new, put all that back together. It didn't fix that problem, but it did fix the dipstick blowing out problem. So the PCV system now seems to be working because that's no longer an issue. I did notice that I do have a power steering leak that's unrelated, but I'll fix that later. It'll be the same kind of hose repair that I did to the fuel, fuel system where I just cut off the ends and make it work. Not a big deal. Uh, I had a pretty nasty coolant leak and I realized that somebody had put one of those uh, quick release drain valve on the radiator hmm. and it was loose enough that once it built up pressure, it just pissed out of the radiator. Yep. So I closed that and that's fine. So no issue there anymore. So the coolant leak there is done. Uh, what else happened? I did do the spark plugs. I pulled the spark plugs out. They looked like they were brand new, but they were black. They weren't worn at all, but they were black, which I assume is from trying to start the car, you know, without having it actually start and cranking it over and getting fuel in there and, and all that kind of stuff. So I did put new plugs in, uh, bought brand new NGKs because that's what you do with a Japanese car. You run the NGKs, right? That's right. right. BPR 5EN something. So those are in there. I did pull off the cap and rotor just be like, hey, maybe it's grossly damaged. They look brand new. There's not even a mark on like the contact points inside the rotor. So I pulled out the air filter just again, double check that, put a new one of those in. The production date in the side of the air filter was 03. All the fluids in the car all look brand new. So my assumption is that when this thing first died, they did all of this stuff preemptively to try to fix it. It was probably because the ECU that was unplugged. It was probably the ECU that was unplugged because everything is brand new. The cap's brand new. The road is brand new. The plugs are brand new. The air filter was brand new. The oil was brand new. The tranny fluid was brand new. I mean, everything is brand new in the car. Nothing was nothing was touched. So it's going to take a little bit of... A little bit of time to figure out what's going on because none of those simple things obviously are causing this issue. So I had a friend come over who is a, a serial Cressida owner. Um, he goes by Cressida Cruisin on Instagram. His name is Christian. He has a X3 like mine and he has an X7 and he has some experience with the fuel injected 4M and 5M. Uh, we were looking at the it's not a mass airflow sensor. It's a, an air fuel valve, mm. an AFV, they call it. Uh, not America's Funniest Home Videos. <laughs> uh, it's inside. It looks just like a mass airflow sensor from the outside. But if you look inside of it, it has a flapper door. Yeah, so, this sounds like an early Bosch system on like a Yeah, it's very, it's car. very similar. But instead of being a, a flap that opens up and down like on a, on a vertical plane, this is a sideways like triangle door that opens on like a horizontal plane. So it's a di slightly different style setup, but the same kind of setup. So I'm also wondering if that might be a problem and I'm having a hard time finding a way to test that piece. I know there's gotta be a way to like jump one wire to another and check, you know, resistance and figure out what it is, but having a hard time finding that. In fact, the, factory service manual that I have doesn't have the fuel system in it. Apparently it was a separate book and I didn't realize that. Uh, so I also have a Chilton manual. So I was like, oh, maybe at least the Chilton manual will have that in it. So I went to the Chilton manual and the Chilton manual says that it can be tested, but that that's not for a backyard mechanic to do and to take it to the dealer. Huh? So I was like, well, that's a, thanks a lot guys. Wait, what year is this thing? In 81? 81. Yeah. You know what? I've got all those old, uh, import books from that shop that was closing that my dad grabbed. Yeah, but they're not their children books, aren't they? No, I don't think they are. I'll look at it after the podcast. Yeah, that'd be great because I guess the children book is literally like, yes, it can be tested, but you should leave that to a professional. I was yeah. like, what? What is that? <laughs> Thanks, guys. <laughs> uh, anyway, I'm not. I'm not going to the Toyota dealer with my eighty one <laughs> eighty one Cressida. To have them test this one little piece, that'd be a four thousand dollar repair bill, and they wouldn't even know what to do with it. No. I probably know more than they do at this point with this guy. Yeah. So I need to figure out how to do that test. Because I think that's, I can buy one okay. that supposedly is known good on eBay for $149. Ooh. So at least it exists, but I don't want to buy it just to find out that I don't need it. Mm. So I did clean it up. It had some corrosion in it. It's like a pot metal piece. Yeah. And it had some, you know, white corrosion and 
maybe it was making a problem with the, the operation of it, but I did clean that all up and that didn't seem to happen either. But So I'm still digging. I'm still trying to figure it out. Um, I put a bunch of transmission fluid in it because I had only checked it when it was off because obviously the car didn't run and it slipped pretty bad pulling out of the driveway. So I filled it up to the proper level with the car running and you know you put it in gear now and it, it pops right into gear. You hit the gas and it takes off right away. No more slipping. So that's good. So the last system in the car to test was the transmission. And I can't get it past first gear because I can't get it past 12 to 15 miles per hour. But I don't have any reason to suspect that it will not shift because everything else seems to work fine with it. It goes in on a gear like right. a brand new car at this point. So literally everything else works. Um, the radio, the brakes, the transmission, everything but the engine revving past a certain speed. So that's literally the last spot that I'm on, and I just need to get that. A couple of things. A, I need the motivation to finish it because it's hard when you're at this point where all of the obvious stuff hasn't done it, and it's having a hard time finding that that data mm. in order to to fix that or test that one part. Because I don't mind spending 150 bucks in the part if it makes the car run. I just I'd hate to spend 150 bucks on a non-returnable electronic part. And have it not make a difference in the car. Yeah. So I hate it, but it's also kind of my favorite part. <laughs> What's that? The troubleshooting? Yeah. I'm just having a weird problem. Listen, I I I fully enjoy it. And when you get it right, it's like the most satisfying thing ever. Because you realize you did this. You know what I mean? Like you sit through all this crap trying to make it work, and then you finally make it work, and it's like this huge, like, I did this. I'm not a trained Toyota technician and I fixed this car. <laughs> Yeah. So it's it's so close to being satisfying at this point. I just I need to get that next little bit. Uh, unfortunately, it's been a busy week. It's going to be a busy weekend. You know, it's Mother's Day weekend, and there's a lot of stuff going on. But I'm going to try to sneak some time in maybe Saturday to to work on it. Also, I think Saturday there might be some video content being made at my right. home for some car stuff. But cool. I don't know. We'll see what happens. But it's it's so close, but so far. I just need to get to that next step and then the fun stuff happens. Because once right. I get past that, it's brakes and tires and wheels and lower it and finish cleaning it and do the interior and and drive the car. So the fun stuff's coming. It's just so close, but yet so far. Uh, another thing happened is that when Christian came over, he actually had a set of brand new front disc brakes for me. He had bought an X7 for his girlfriend, which is the next the next body style Cressida yeah. it came with a brand new brake job in the trunk, hmm. but it did not fit the car weird. And he tested it against his other Cressida. He's next three, like my blue car. And it was too big for that car and too small with the X sevens. He's like, well, this must be an X six brake setup. So he brought it over and we checked everything. And so I got a brake setup for the front of the car now. Cool. So, yeah. Sweet stuff. And they're like nice, like fully coated slotted rotors. Not that it needs them, but whatever. <laughs> I'll put them on the car, right? <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So, uh, it's it's looking up. I'm trying to think of what else happened with the car. Oh, so the intake tube. There was a 45-degree, two-inch rubber elbow. So, there's a, there's a the intake manifold is on the driver's side of the car. And the actual air intake for the car is on the passenger side. So, it crosses over the top of the valve cover. And there is a plastic tube that goes from the intake manifold to the other side of the valve cover. And then there's a rubberish kind of like rubbery plastic, 45 degree, two inch elbow yeah. that takes a turn towards the right front corner of the car. And inside that is a black pipe. And then it goes to the piece that I was talking about that has the flapper door in it. Mm -hmm. So that 45 degree elbow was split. And I've been trying to test the car with the piece all duct taped together. So obviously that could also be a huge air leak because duct tape is not necessarily the best sealing properties for something with that much <laughs> airflow going through it. And then duct tape is designed to seal, but it might not be perfect. <laughs> so I did manage to just buy a like silicone coupler off of Amazon Yeah, in the, in the right dimensions and the right angle. So I can replace that. But one thing I did discover is that black <laughs> tube that comes out of that rubber hose and goes down to that, you know, uh, air intake, air fuel valve or air fuel meter is much heavier than I thought it should be. 
And I picked it up and I was like, why is this a 40 pound pipe going across the middle of the car? Well, it turns out there's supposed to be a silencer there. And the silencer is like a plastic case that's two sides. And I guess they split in the middle. So somebody took this silencer out and they literally put a piece of fence post in the car. Nice. Yeah, it's so heavy. It's no wonder that that couple are ripped. <laughs> it's been holding this literal piece of fence post, like, you know, quarter inch thick, heavy duty, like aluminized steel fence post that somebody painted black. I took it out. I was like, this is clearly a fence post. <laughs> like, it's obvious yeah. what it is. <laughs> it's like, that Mechanic. is annoying as hell. Yeah. But it's in there for now. It works for now. I'll find some kind of a uh, a thinner, lighter, two inch diameter tube to put in there. I just I'm not worried about it yet. Just make the guy run first. It'll be down the road. So it's it's so close, Andrew. I, I can like I can taste it. I can feel it. I don't know if I can taste the unburnt fuel or the mouse poop, but I can taste something. Yeah. And I know I know we're close. It's just getting it there. And I finally actually did a full like exterior cleaning on the car because I hadn't done that yet either. So I was like, I need to reset my clock here, reset my thoughts. I'm going to wash the entire outside of the car. So it only like kind of looked clean because it's gotten rained on. So it was pretty, it was pretty grody. So I cleaned it up and uh, it now looks less abandoned in the driveway. Honestly, with the new windshield and the exterior cleaned and air in all the tires and, you know, it moves from spot to spot in the driveway now. It looks like a running driving car. It, uh, it's pretty encouraging. So good. Just got to get that last step. Then I have tons of fun plans for the interior. You know, once we finish with the uh, exterior lowering and putting tires on it, the interior is going to have, it's going to be fun. So stay tuned for that one. But anyway, that's my project car update. I put air in the tires of the Eclipse again because one of them leaks. Yeah. It's, it's, getting, it's getting an oil change this weekend as well. Because, you know, that's my daily now. So it's getting 3,000 miles a month, which is an oil change a month, right? Mm hmm. So I've been pushing it to two months, but it's fine. I think 6,000 miles on modern oil is okay, right? In a short period of time, just highway driving. Yeah. I think it'll be okay. As long as you don't run out. No, no. I check it every time I fill it up. So it's not usually low enough to be concerned at each fill up, but I'll usually just, you know, top it off with an eighth of a quart or something just to make sure it stays topped off. So don't want to ruin it. That's for sure. Got to keep driving it at least until I have the crest of a reliable and running and driving or that Honda Civic finished. So one step at a time. Yep. No other project cars. That's all I've done. It's a pretty good, uh, pretty good list there. I just ordered parts for the G20. I forgot. I ordered exhaust for it because it just, yeah. From Greg. Yeah, I. it was funny. After the podcast, we found out that the place I was looking at ordering it from is actually your friend Greg, a BR, yes. BRM Exhaust. Yep. Which Greg has a bunch of different company names for a bunch of different things, and I didn't realize BRM Exhaust was one of his. Um, yep. You sent me the link, and I clicked on sounds. it. <laughs> yeah, and I was reading it, and in the end, it's like, it's at his name. And I was like, wait a second. You order this exhaust, it's going to be made down the street from my house. Yep. <laughs> because the... Uh, I'll get to it. Why I was driving this weekend and the muffler decided to completely split along the seam. It's like super loud now. So, right. I've got a track night coming up this week and I guess I'm going to drive it like that. I don't, <laughs> cause I don't think I'll have the exhaust in time. Ear so, muffs. um, yeah, well, it's kind of tricky now that I'm thinking of it. I hope I can do it because at New Hampshire motor speedway, the, the, so Thompson, the the limits 103 decibels, which is pretty loud. It's very loud. But at New Hampshire, the, the decibel limit is 90, which is not very loud. Do you think it's beyond that? Uh, a wide open I throttle, mean, maybe. Just I can do it, and, and if they tell me to yeah. stop, then they tell me to stop. Yeah. I guess nothing else you can do. Yeah. You could throw a cheap muffler on for the day, I guess. Yeah. I don't know. That'd be more work, I think. Than, it would definitely be more work. Because, like, cheap mufflers aren't even that cheap. You don't have one in the backyard somewhere? No. Take one off the blazer? 
No. <laughs> Just got to do what you got to do, Andrew. <laughs> Don't have one. Put a turn down on it. Priority turns down. It does. It's its problem is that it's split. Like, it's basically not a muffler anymore. It's just a open pieces of sheet metal. Yeah. It's, now it's an echo chamber. Actually makes yeah. it louder instead of muffling it. Yeah. Uh, especially at sucks. certain, like, highway speeds coming down. It's, like, really loud. Like a, a really drone. bad drone. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then I was trying to get brakes for it because the, the basic brake pads I put on the front of it and rotors are definitely like, um, why are you doing drag this? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. They're making like a little squeaky noise as you drive them. And like, you can see just, they're super shiny. <laughs> like they're way shinier yeah. than they should be. We were meant to drive to work, not around the racetrack. Yeah. I, I was going to try to get some HPS pads, just throw them on there and a, and a couple of clean rotors. <laughs> yeah. It's probably worth it. Yeah. Probably worth so, it. So anyway, that. so speaking of your loud car, uh, yeah, I, events. I did an event over the weekend, the all day breakfast rally, which is up in Vermont. Speaking of the morning breakfast runs we were just talking about. Yeah, it was pretty cool. Met with some cool people in Vermont. Uh, a listener of the show and uh, quickly becoming a friend of ours is uh, Scott. He's got the, an Isuzu Stylus. Been to a couple of rad Which ones. is a, a rad random car. Yeah. It's, it's like it's like a cool like alternative performance sedan of the 90s. Like, mm-hmm. One you don't think of. It's like it's like a G twenty for people who think. <laughs> okay, thanks. <laughs> not that he refers to that. <laughs> but hey, listen, the G twenty is already the centra for the thinking man, and the the stylus is the G twenty for the wanting to be different thinking man. How's that sound? All right. So the. It's funny because they were parked next to each other, and the stylus is even smaller than the G20. Oh, yeah. They're not big cars. I didn't really. I thought they were like a, a comparable sedan size of the 90s, but they're really small. Is it an all-wheel drive one? Nope. So it's a front-wheel drive twin cam? Mm-hmm. Is it a handling by Lotus sticker yes. car? Yep. Excellent. Yeah. It's a very it's cool very car. Cool. I remember well, my, I think, did my aunt have one? Somebody, maybe my family had one. Or maybe they didn't have the performance version of it. They had the regular version of it. I remember like even back then being like, that's an interesting car. It's different. I don't know much about it. And then it was cool. He invited his friend Tom, who's got a bunch of cars, I guess. But because he knew I was bringing a G20, he brought his J30. Which is very cool. Uh, Super, super nice, like 93 J30. Same color green on the tan leather. How quickly did you offer him money to add it to your growing I, I did not. sedan collection? I did not, because oh, okay. it's not a 95. Oh, okay. If it was 95, <laughs> you would have had a choice. It would have been, yeah. It would have been required. No, I listen, I've always loved those. Um, they're not they they were not they were not loved when they were new. I think that they were too closely priced to an I thirty, which was a more standard looking vehicle. Nope, and the didn't J thirty exist. was <laughs> didn't exist yet? Nope. I thirties came out in ninety seven, like the oh, last okay. year of the J thirty. Okay. It so was, they just weren't popular. They were like a really bizarre avant-garde styling car. Well, they were what a Nissan Leopard in Japan. Yeah. So they were a home market car that they brought here as an Infinity, like the rest of them. It's the same. But they had kind of chassis as the M30, I believe. It's the same drivetrain. It's, the, it's that. It's the VQ. It's the same yeah, as a non-turbo 300 ZX. Yeah. yeah. But it doesn't yeah, have the multi-link in the front. It's got struts. They're neat cars, though. I like them. I mean, they're different looking. Uh, I I had a friend in high school who had one that was maroon with a tan leather interior, mm-hmm. which is a pretty common color, I think, of the day, and I always liked that car. Uh, there's one floating around the internet lately that's the same color combo, but it has a set of uh, Crown Vic Sport wheels on it, I think. Uh, Firebird wheels. Oh, the Firebird wheels? Okay, I know there was mm-hmm. some American car. Yep. The mesh like GTA wheel. Yeah. And the car looks really rad. <laughs> so they it had it you know, it was behind me. It's got really good road presence. Yep. It's definitely yep. A, an interesting take on a car. It was very he owns some British cars and he's like, Yeah, it's definitely a very British feeling car. Like that's like it's almost like they made it to attract people who would buy a Jaguar 
to infinity. Yeah, if you put a Jaguar or a Sterling badge on it, you probably wouldn't question it. You yeah. didn't know what it was. Because Infinity was really going for that European flair with Japanese for cars sure. at the yeah, time. For sure they They're were. trying to attract it's, a well, the direct that competition would, yeah. was the European cars. The yeah. Q forty five was a five series or you know, a uh, E class, right? It was the same Yep. And uh same the same G twenty was like a three series or like a um yeah, it was basically a three series. Sure. Or like an Audi Oh, what would have been a small Audi in the was that actually yeah the like 90 maybe they called it Audi 90 yeah well the one that came after the 4000 and the Quattro Coupe the slightly more rounded one they had the uh and then a 90 I think maybe 90 I think it's it's a 90 or a 100 it depends on where you bought the car their, their naming convention was not good until they came out with the A4 A5 A6 <laughs> yeah they were very confusing they were whatever a small Mercedes was I don't know a C class in the 90s yeah. Or a, oh man, yep, the car that the Cosworth was based on with the 90s, yeah. Bombers, 80s. Those are neat though, the rear drive in Land 6s. I, I think, think a 3 Series was really the target for it though, because it was a, a sporty sedan, just the alternative no, I think being it's, for I think its, its main competition was probably a, a, a uh, Integra, right? Like an Integra sedan? Yeah, but... I think they were going for more of a European feel with the car. Okay. Well, it is a cool car. I dig it a lot. So, makes but, sense. But the G20, the G20, the um, J30 is a neat car. I always liked them. I know they were not a, a popular choice to like, but I always liked the look of them. Uh, I like that connection to the Japanese model. They brought the Japanese model over here and didn't change anything except what the steering wheel was. And mm-hmm. it's, uh, it's pretty neat. So, I dig them. If I found a clean one, I would definitely drive it. There's JDM ones. There was a JDM version that had the Q45 V8 in it, which oh, is even that's wilder. Even yeah, <laughs> um, way into that. But he was telling me he's got he's he's fixed a lot of issues with it. Uh, he paid somebody to do the time belt. I was like, that's a good idea because it's kind of a nightmare to do on those cars. Sure. Um, and like some parts are hard to get. Like he had to get struts. You use like 944 struts in the front or something. Okay. Like a spacer, and then like two forty SX like struts in the rear, which makes sense. Well, well, just like your Q forty five, you couldn't just go down to the parts store and buy struts. You had to get them, you know, from multiple sources overseas. Yeah, so it happens. Yeah, that's what I was telling him. I was like, oh yeah, you, had, you could probably get them, but you'd have to order them from overseas to get OEM ones. But right, but and if one is cool works, car. then great. Yeah, yeah. He's There's one some of other cool that stuff. Has a, actually, has a Sterling too, isn't he? Yeah. I didn't get to talk to him about it, but I guess he was one of the guys that drove the Sterlings to um, Radwood. Snowed out Radwood. Yeah. Or the iced out Radwood, I guess. But, uh, yeah, anyway, the rally uh, was pretty fun. We did some fun. Vermont, Vermont's got a lot of fun roads. It was a super nice day. Um, Who hosts this rally? Uh, it's the people that run uh, One Hell of a Town. So Sid the, oh, and David? Yeah. Okay. That's cool. Uh, and it there was also like there's a little shop down the street from their house, a little independent shop. And that guy's a younger guy, like our age. He came by and he did the rally in his. Um, what's the. It's a Mitsubishi pickup. Is it just uh, a Mighty Max? Mighty Max. Yeah. Four drive Mighty Max. That's cool. I don't know why I completely blanked on it. Well, because Toyota was just a pickup, so. Yeah. Um, so that was pretty cool. He was, like, rolling around the corners. <laughs> yeah, almost rolling over. Uh, there was a guy with a super clean Mark II. Or was it Mark One? Volkswagen? Yeah. I haven't seen enough pictures to know. Was I was trying to look for pictures other than the pictures that you sent me, and it's hard to. There wasn't a lot. Like, they have an well, Instagram page for the event, but nothing's on it. <laughs> It's supposed to be low key, man. I get it, but <laughs> I wanted some pictures at least. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, some cool cars, nice people. Had some maple donuts and apple cider donuts, and excellent, cool, cool lunch place in Woodstock, Vermont. Vermont's a really cool state. I like Vermont. Yeah, there's a lot of cool stuff up there. Un- a lot of cool un- topography too. <laughs> Unfortunately, like as soon as we got there, Scott with the Stylus is like, 
I don't know. My oil pressure gauge has dropped lower than it's ever dropped before. I've never seen it do that in the 20 years I've owned the car. And I was like, uh, I was like, you're probably fine. Maybe it's just a loose wire. Uh, he, he was not. Turns fine. out, it yeah, was not a loose wire. Yeah. Uh, yeah unfortunately, the car just, needs an engine now. I saw the picture of the oil pan. It was, uh, yeah, full of full of stuff that would shouldn't have been there. So him and his buddy Tom, they stuck together, and uh, he got the car home, and now he's putting an engine in it, and he's trying to get it ready for. They're doing another radwood at. Um, Greenwich Concourse, which is actually earlier this year, June. Yep, it's in June. So he he got accepted for a spot to that. So he's trying to get just a, I guess he told me a, at least a a used but running engine from the from the Isuzu community just to throw it in the car so it he can get it to that. I think he yeah. has one. Yeah, he's trying to throw that together and then meanwhile build a zero mileage engine, brand new one, yeah, for over the winter. So I wish the best of luck to him. I know he's working on it, so. I think yeah, I'd love to see him because I'm going to happen to be in New England the weekend of Radwood at Greenwich. So I will be there. And I have uh, no idea from bringing either. a car. I haven't even tried to ask or I, submit a car. You should ask um, because I did. Yeah. Um, I don't think I told you this yet because I kind of forgot about it because, like I said, it's been a crazy week. Oh, thanks. Uh, sorry. <laughs> I meant to tell you about it, but it, it all went down. When I was talking to my dad last Sunday. We are entering his Celica. Okay. So you guys are going to drive it down. So we're going to drive the Celica down and enter the Celica and it's been accepted. So we're good. So you should definitely ask about, you know, bringing a car. So okay. Right. Highly recommended. Yeah. Sorry. Right. I totally escaped my mind. I didn't tell you. So it's been a crazy week. Yeah, I it. there's like all of a sudden a, a bunch of Radwoods, which is good. Yeah, well, <laughs> there's one I this weekend in was, Cleveland that I can't make, but that's I fine. wonder if that was what's going to happen once uh, you know the Haggerty money got behind it and they were able to, you know, actually rent places and actually have some additional yeah, pull they might have time for. So yeah. So I think, um, no, I'm definitely not going to the Cleveland one. I just can't make it because it's Mother's Day weekend. Um, if I lived in the area, it would be a lot easier. Sure. But uh, still going to Philly. Or Mother's Day is fine. <laughs> taking the whole weekend, that's rough. Yeah. still We're still going to Philly. Well, I am. I don't know what you're doing. I don't, I'm not going to Philly, no. All right. Well, Unless I'm some miracle go- and plane tickets like get cut in a third, uh, I'm not going. Because right now, the cheapest round trip ticket I could find was like $750. Yeah. And, well, uh, I don't. I, listen, I love Radwoods. I'm not spending seven hundred and fifty dollars just to fly no, him back. So no, it doesn't make sense. So it does not make sense. I'm definitely going. I don't know what car it's going to be in. I'm trying to make the Q45. If not, it's not like I don't have other cars to go in. So actually, what weekend is that? It's the twenty first. I'm definitely not going because I have plane tickets to go somewhere else that weekend. <laughs> okay, fair enough. So I'm I'm going to pick up the new car that weekend. So all right. So, well, uh, I'll tease that a little bit. It involves a car you mentioned earlier on this podcast. That's all I'm going to say. Yep. Or cool. at least parts of. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know what it is, but. I do know what it is. Um, I just don't want to say it out loud in case something happens that doesn't happen or whatever, but. Okay. You know, all signs point to it happening. I just. Yeah. We'll wait till, we'll wait till the keys are in my hands before we make any official statements. So. I, you seem to be going on a buying spree of cars. I'm no, if got... I don't. I don't think I am. <laughs> I well, think back to it. I so, mean, you're going for those that you know, one thousand, seven thousand dollar car level, right? Is that what you're going for? Everything under ten grand. <laughs> All right. Um, well, what happened was, I bought this Cressida right before Christmas, right? And that was totally on a whim. Because it was six hundred dollars. Okay, that was the only reason for it. Then this Honda Civic fell in my lap, and for a thousand dollar car that at the time ran had cold AC, fully worth it. Then my Saab got crashed. So I was down a car. 
Then I sold the Volkswagen. So I was down two cars. Down a car from 14 to 12? Right. Yes. So far down of cars. Listen, does the, the total number of cars is not the important factor here. The important factor is the math of minus two plus one. Okay. So I got rid of the Saab and got rid of the Volkswagen. And I'm buying this car in mid-May. But you added so the Honda. But the Honda doesn't really count. Okay. Listen, I, I did I talk about this in the show? I know I talked about it to you guys. I decided I just don't care anymore. Um, it makes me happy. You could not so, care. I'm still going to give you crap about it. <laughs> which is fine. But I'm just going to let you know that I'm rubber and you're glue. It doesn't matter. <laughs> I don't care. Just tell me whatever you want. It's not going to change anything. Until the point where I have, you know, a neighbor complaining there's too many cars in the yard or a Naomi complaining there's too many cars in the yard, I'm not going to stop. And I'm at a place in my life where I think back to like four or five years ago when I had just as many cars and I had like one of them that ran. And now I'm at a point in my life where I have the same amount of cars and most of them run. Okay. That's pretty rad, right? All right. I mean, I can get in the Cressida, the blue Cressida tomorrow, the Sapporo tomorrow, the Colt tomorrow, the Eclipse tomorrow, and drive any one of those four cars to work. So it's fine. All right. I could even drive the new Cressida to work if I wanted to go 15 miles an hour the whole way. (laughs) Or even the Starion to work if I wanted to drive 15 miles an hour the whole way. So everything runs. Uh, except for the Toyota pickup and the Galant. All right. Right? That's it. And the 79 Colt that I forget exists. Yeah. But it's fine. <laughs> anyway, I'm excited because everything works. I don't care. It makes me happy. I'm doing it for me. Uh, I have less money in my entire collection of cars than most people have in one new car anyway. And I've bought all of them cheap enough that if I needed to get out of them, I could break even without even trying and make money with barely trying hard. So that's kind of how I'm looking at it. Right. I may be diseased, but I'm not looking for a cure anymore. So my only concern is to focus on like to make them nice enough. That's what I've been doing. I'm okay. sure you've noticed. The only cars I've been wrenching on are when I'm in New England, I work on the 74 Colt. And that 74 Colt is almost pretty nice now, right? Once I finish rebuilding that carb, that car will be like 100% mechanical. Okay. And then it'll just be, you know, cosmetic stuff. And this Cressida is the only car I work on out here right now because I'm making it to the point where it's going to be nice. And then I'm going to do the interior and the car is actually going to be nice. So... Right. My goal is that my goal is to have that car in a condition by like late July because that's when JCCS registration opens up, mm-hmm. and you just submit pictures of the cars to be accepted into JCCS. So my goal is to have that car either done in time for that, or I have a moving deadline. If I miss that deadline, then I'll make sure it's done in time for Redwood LA okay. at the end of the year. So those are the moving goals for that car. All right. Yeah, no, I listen, I again, it is what it is. I'm just going to embrace it. Uh, it was it was unhealthy of me to try to fix it because it wasn't a problem. So I'm not going to fix it anymore. And I'm going to fix the cars instead. So it's all happening. It's all happening. And I can't even begin to tell you how many parts we've collected for the Mustang. And that will be next as soon as the Cressida is at a point where it's running and driving. So... All right. Concentration on one at a time. That's how I'm doing it. Just trying to keep you honest here. Yeah. It's the only way to do it. And the only other thing that, and I'll say this out loud right now on the podcast, is that I have a deadline for myself for this year on the Gallant as well. I had talked to somebody about possibly purchasing it. That still might be a thing. But I also would like to say to myself, if I haven't at least have the engine assembled by the end of this year, it's time to move it on. Mm-hmm. So I'm, I'm going to stick to that come December 31st. If the motor is not together, uh, the car will 100% be sold. If the motor is 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 together, then we'll we'll readjust the goal because 
I don't know how fast I can get the motor together and in the car being 3,000 miles away from the car. So that is the goal of that car. But yeah, you're, you're right, Andrew. I need to concentrate one at a time. And that was the biggest mistake I was making in the past. I was doing a little here and a little there and a little here on everything, and it wasn't working out. So I've now, I've now changed that. My math, as I said, is uh, minus two plus one. The car that I'm buying is mechanically sound. Like I'm literally flying two states away, going and get in the car, turn it on and drive it back down here. Uh, it only needs some minor cosmetic stuff and the AC to be taken care of. But those to me aren't a big deal to, to take care of. So it's a, uh, it's a windshield replacement and uh, AC to be taken care of, but that's easy. So, okay. Anyway, it is what it is. It's, it's a problem, but not a problem I'm upset to have. So what are we talking about? I'm way off topic now. Your event. Did you do any other events? No. No, no. That was it. <laughs> Perfect. I haven't done any either. No, I, I haven't been doing it. Yeah, I haven't been to a Cars and Coffee in a while. I haven't been into any kind of... I've I've actually been busy here working on the, uh, the Cressida. So it's kind of taken me away from from the events. And this weekend, I might do the one... Saturday night event, but I know we have, you know, other other things happening this weekend, so we'll wind up skipping that. But anyway, think that's an episode, Andrew. That is an episode. So excellent. Uh, follow us on Out of Topic Podcast on Facebook, Out of Topic on Instagram. Much more active on there. Uh, you follow me, Race and Anger on Instagram. Don't forget. Uh, drop me a message. I'll send you an invite to the Discord if you want to join us over there. It's not really, there's nothing in the chats right now. I'll have to throw some stuff in there. It's just kind of getting kicked off. So I was waiting to invite everyone. Sure um, Brad, where can they find you? Uh, they can find me at TSISS350 on Instagram. They can also find me on Discord. I'm already there anyway, so it'll be easy to keep up with this chat. You know, we have a, a few other group chats that we've been part of, and this is uh, kind of what brought us there. Keep an eye out for the Four Noon Cup. If you have any ideas and you're in the Boston or Phoenix area and want to join, uh, have any ideas of, you know, destinations or places or whatever to go to, uh, definitely hit us up with that. Take everything into consideration, and we're going to try to make this a thing. So looking forward to it. Cool. So, as always, keep cars analog and aim for the roses. Yeah.